Hi, chemistry students. Let's continue our journey into the thermodynamic world and uh, look at a few systems right off the bat and kind of get a feel for where we're going with this. And the idea is this. Look at this first example of, 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 of a system here, system A. It's just a ball, and if we let this ball go, it's going to roll down this hill. And you know this is going to happen. You've seen it happen. It, it's going to happen every time, right? But how, what, would, what, what would happen if I put the ball here instead? What if the ball was at the bottom of the hill? If I let go of the ball, would it just roll up the hill? Would it ever do that? Can you imagine the ball ever rolling up the hill? I certainly can't. So that tells us a little bit of something. Try this one out. Let's go, to, let's go over here to B. So here we are looking at... Uh, at this little section of B here, this this system, and I'm going to put this 10, this negative 10 degree centigrade ice cube into this 50 degree centigrade liquid water, and would you ever imagine that the ice cube would get colder and go to minus 20 degrees, and the and the water would start to get warmer, like 55 or 60 degrees, the liquid water that is. No, you know what's going to happen. The ice cube is going to be melted by this warm water and at some point they're going to all be at the same temperature and reach this thermal equilibrium. So what this tells us is, is a very interesting, interesting piece of information and that is there is a natural direction there's a natural direction to spontaneous processes. This is actually a very, very important thing to know because this is a version of the second law of thermodynamics. See, here's the deal. The first law says it's okay what we saw above. The first law is okay with no matter, first law of thermo, is okay with the ice cube, with ice cube at 20, or minus 20. It's cool with that. It says, you know what? I can keep track of that. That's an easy thing to understand. I can keep track. All right, so delta E is equal to um, Q plus W, and we imagine that there's no work being done, so we cancel that out because there's no PV being changed here. And we say, oh, there's some energy flows from the ice cube into the liquid water, making making it okay for this liquid for this ice cube to get colder, okay, and the, and the liquid water to get hotter, to get warmer, and that would just never happen. So the first law, all it does is it sets boundaries. It says here's here's what we can do. We can keep track of things. We can we can balance our checkbook, our energy checkbook, but it doesn't tell us which way things move on a natural progression. Um, so that's what the second law is going to do. The second law is going to, is going to try to tell us what it means to be a, a natural direction, what it means to be a spontaneous process. And that's what we're really asking right now is, is, is how do we describe when something is going to happen, if it's going to happen? That's the goal of thermodynamics. So if we're trying to see, are, is this spontaneous? If I mix these two chemicals together, will they spontaneously react to form the products? That's what thermodynamics is all about. So the, what we've just seen here is a, which is with two simple examples, a, ne a necessity to go beyond the first law and create the second law of ther thermodynamics. So the second law, okay, it's going to establish this, that uh, these spontaneous processes, they proceed, oops, they proceed in a natural direction. All right, so they proceed in the natural direction, and by the word spontaneous, we have a special meaning to that. You kind of know what it means, but spontaneous to us will, will mean it, it, it will occur without outside interference. That means I don't have to stir it, I don't have to make things happen. It's spontaneous. It goes on without me intervening in the process. So that's what we mean by spontaneous. So when, when we mix the chemicals together, once they're mixed, we stop intervening. We're no longer part of the process. 
Now that they're together, will they react? That's what we're always trying to figure out in chemistry. So let's talk about a few things that have been observed about spontaneous processes for a long time. And it goes like this. Spontaneous processes They tend to be, one, they usually release energy. Now that just means they're exothermic in general, but it doesn't mean that they're always, because this word usually is important. It's not always, it's most of the time. And, and most of the time may even be too much. It might be 60, 70%. I don't know the number. I don't think anyone does. The key thing is that it seems that a majority a, a, a large majority of our spontaneous processes give off energy. And it seems to make sense because things like to go in nature to a lower energy state. And so if you give off energy, that would be a, a, natural, a natural direction. All right, what else? Well, it also is seen that these processes, they once again usually, and I'll underline it again, they usually move towards more complex arrangements. Now this one's hard to imagine right off the bat until I give you this one example. And the one example I'm going to give you is a plate being dropped. If I drop a plate, it's going to break into a bunch of pieces. That's what I know is going to happen. So when I dropped it, I I'd lifted it up and given it some potential energy. When I released it, that potential energy was converted into kinetic energy. When it hit the floor, that energy was, was just crashed open and the darn plate broke into pieces. There's no way that I'm going to sweep up all the pieces of that plate, put it up and hold it the same height over the ground, drop it and have that plate put itself back together. I mean, we're talking Humpty Dumpty here. And there's no way that's going to happen. You know that a plate is just going to break into pieces. And that's a more complex arrangement, wouldn't you say? Sure. So these are what normally happens in these kind of situations. Uh, just as an example, we also see that most, most compounds ionize, ionize a bit, at least a bit. It's not 100% true, and but little teeny bits, uh, especially if we, if, we, if we change this to salts, boy, we would be right on top of things. Most salts do ionize a bit in water. So let's, let's go with that. A salt will dissociate into ions, and we see that that's a far more complex pro, uh, situation. It used to be all in one little piece. You could see it, and now it's spread out. It's actually so small you can't see the pieces anymore when you put them into water. So <clears throat> what we have here is a framework for understanding spontaneous processes and predicting whether something will happen. It seems that there's two important issues. One is the energy flow in or out of the system. And the other one is the arrangement of the pieces that make up the system. So for chemistry, that means chemical bonds, whether they're made or broken, how many are made or broken, how many substances we have. So it took a while for scientists to figure out how do we how do we quantify this whole situation? So, well, the energy part's easy. The energy part is easy to quantify. We can just quantify this already. This is, this is enthalpy. So this quantifies the energy part. But what about this other piece? We don't have a variable that talks about that. So let's make one up. Let's make up a variable. Let's, let's, let's call Let's call this, um, this other thing, this ability, this need, this call this a need for, call the need for complex, complexity. We're going to call that entropy. All right. So, and we're going to give it the symbol S because uh, that's very confusing. And, uh, you know, so that's how we do things in science. Now, there's, a, there's, an, there's a, a, a Greek word and all that good stuff that makes this all fit together. We don't need to know the history of it. But entropy is given the symbol S, and it's a very, very important, important thing. So here's the question. What in the world is entropy? How are we going to define it? 
And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop here. Now that we have a reason for entropy, I'm going to stop it so you have this little video to watch. And then we're going to go through a couple different points of view of what entropy is. So stay tuned, watch the next video, and you'll get uh, even more information about this very important new thing called entropy.